Welcome to the World Diabetes Day 2022. But yes, diabetes is 24-7, 365. To those of us who are living with diabetes and families that are caring for one that is living with diabetes. Often around the world, today, people are commemorating the birth of Sir Frederick Bente. But this date was made official in 2006 by the United Nations. And now, around the world, this day means so much, especially to the international diabetes community. Because by the discovery of insulin in 1921, it was a game changer for all those of us who are living with diabetes. Because if it wasn't for insulin, we would have died. We wouldn't be here today. And now it's been 100 years since insulin was discovered. However, so many people around the world today are still having challenges to access insulin because of the pharma greedy. But today we have to commemorate this day. I think like Sir Frederick Benting is one of the people that really deserved that Nobel Prize that she got for this discovery of insulin that has meant the world to everybody who is living with diabetes. It meant that like people, people's hopes were restored by this insulin because it is a hormone that is needed to help you to live, to lead a healthy quality life. Without insulin, there's no life. Without insulin, I think like that is why we say that insulin is like oxygen that we need each and every day. Today on the World Diabetes Day 2022, the diabetic mogul is proud to bring amazing and stellar voices within the diabetes community in the name of November Diabetes Awareness Month. And that included a person living with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, latent autoimmune diabetes in the adults, that is what we call ladder. A person with type 1 diabetes who has had a transplant and a person with type 1 diabetes who had had um, a misdiagnosis and also a caregiver. So a big shout out goes to Reza, Kane, Leon, Jill, Dr. Felissa and also Renee. So thank you so much and I hope that you enjoy the show. Please remember that there is one disease, one symbol, one world. And please, happy World Diabetes Day 2022. Unite for diabetes insulin for all and let's continue to pay it forward nothing about us without us thank you so as much as i'd like to say that diabetes hasn't impacted my life of course it has uh, before i was diagnosed with diabetes i was a music teacher i was playing the flute uh, i certainly wasn't spending all my time working in diabetes organizations and traveling the world talking about diabetes and writing about diabetes so i guess the main way that it's impacted my life has been my career and that's not to say that it's worse or you know it's a bad thing it's just certainly not what i was thinking my life was going to be like when i was diagnosed at 24 years of age so what's my secret to managing diabetes? I don't really have a secret. I guess there are some things that I wish I'd known when I was diagnosed and um, sort of found out through life with diabetes. Um, the first is I really wish that somebody had said to me um, that psychologists might be a really useful part of your diabetes multidisciplinary care team. Um, it certainly was never mentioned to me at diagnosis and I think it would have been really, really useful. Even if I didn't need to see a psychologist at that point, but at least knowing that that could have been part of the health professional team that I engaged with to, um, to help me understand and manage diabetes. And also um, to learn and to know about peer support. Finding other people with diabetes has truly been the most important, um, I guess, improvement to my management and, and to just feeling better about life with diabetes. Having people around who get it and who understand it and who really know what that day-to-day -day life with diabetes is all about is incredible. So finding those peer networks and peer people and, and friends who are living with diabetes, that certainly has made a big difference to me. And I wish I you know, could go back in time and, and start doing that earlier, I guess, than I, than I did. Healthcare and diabetes care in Australia is overall, I guess, really great. I mean, we're very fortunate in terms of, um, you know, we have what's called the NDSS, the National Diabetes Services Scheme, and that provides subsidies for most diabetes um, products. I mean, there are rules and regulations and eligibility criteria, but for me, with my type 1 diabetes, my CGM is, is very heavily um, and significantly funded and subsidised. Um, insulin is very subsidised as well. We, are, we I feel very, very fortunate for that. And and I live in a major city, so I've got really great access to healthcare professionals as well. But I guess the biggest thing that I would love to change and 
to an earlier point, and that is that there would be more um, support, psychological, emotional, mental health support for people with diabetes. I really, really wish that we had a mindset of mental health care is diabetes care, diabetes care is mental health care, because I genuinely don't believe that that they're separate, that it, it is all one. So I think that that would be my biggest hope for, for the future is that we really do see, start to see psychologists as being more of a part of diabetes healthcare um, to help people with diabetes and our mental health because that is often the thing that so many of us really, really do struggle with. Hi, my name is Ken Tate. I'm a person with type 2 diabetes and I have been uh, on insulin since I was first diagnosed in 1999 where I used to take insulin twice a day. Now I take it multiple times a day because it sits my lifestyle and the way I live my life so that it gives me a good quality of life. If you are new to diabetes, and especially those with us that are type two, please do learn as much as you can about diabetes because then you can be your own advocate and be much more at ease with your healthcare professionals. Also, go to support groups, as these will help you to understand how other people cope and manage with their diabetes on a daily basis. Because remember, we do this 24-7. There is no holiday. My biggest area that I try to get people to understand is the stigma that surrounds uh, diabetes. We need to abolish it and get rid of it, especially the shame because we feel shamed for some known reason. It was our fault. The technology, which would be great if we could all get it, especially for everybody with any type of diabetes. And insulin to be stopped using as a threat, because we all have insulin after all. The guilt, stop feeling guilty about your diabetes because there's nothing to be guilty about. We can all get diabetes differently. And there are many, many reasons for getting diabetes. The media, I would wish they would be much more friendly to towards people and stop saying oh this will cure it or that will put you into remission or this will do this that or the next thing because we no longer know when we're going to get a cure for diabetes and that doesn't matter what type of diabetes that it is and a for being accepting ourselves for who we are and what we are and all types of diabetes coming together to work together and to be together so that we can influence those that need to be influenced to help us manage our diabetes and eventually hopefully someday in the future there will be a cure hi my name is leon tribe i live in sydney australia and i have lada which is a subform of type 1 diabetes i was diagnosed at the age of 43 and have had um type 1 now for just a little over five years in terms of the impact type 1 has had on my life um Overall, uh, paradoxically, it's been positive. Um, it's made me think a lot more about my health, which when you're getting into your 40s is very, very important. Uh, and it's allowed me to use my um, technical uh, background. I've also got a bit of background in physics in new ways, right? So I can, I've brought uh, my knowledge of software and um, my ability to understand academic works to the diabetes community. So I can read things like medical papers. I can blog about them and uh, hopefully expose them to a wider audience to help people get educated about their diabetes. It's also introduced me to a wealth of passionate advocates around the world through programs like uh, DDoc, uh, which is fantastic, just meeting these like-minded individuals. Um, and even locally, I started a uh, Type 1 um, monthly meetup and just uh, meeting that local community, uh, and it's so knowledgeable. What's fantastic about Type 1 is you can have someone like myself who's only had diabetes for five years but then you can meet someone who is very much younger in age but who has had the disease for say 20 years and is much more knowledgeable and is a, has, has a lot of wisdom. Uh, in terms of the secret for managing it, I, I see it as um, three main areas. Uh, first, you must learn as much as you can. There's excellent websites like the NCBI uh, website uh, which allows you to browse peer-reviewed um, scientific papers and so you can go through there and, and you can find out the latest innovations you can find out the kinds of medications you should be talking to your um, healthcare team about another key aspect I think with 
diabetes is um, don't be afraid to be your own advocate. So with that knowledge, you can go to your healthcare team and you can ask them about those things that you find in the in the papers. Um, but don't be don't discount your own knowledge and experience. Uh, as, as someone who's living who's lived with diabetes twenty four seven, you've certainly been exposed to disease a lot more than most of the people in your healthcare team. So don't be afraid if uh, your healthcare team say something which doesn't sound right, doesn't there's something not right about it uh, to push back, uh, because because odds on that you, your experience can inform whatever decision is is being discussed or made. And to the third point. The, the other secret to um, good management is having that good healthcare team, um, getting those people around you which are not telling you what to do because then you're not part of the decision process and you're not bringing your experience to the table. It's people who are um, effectively consultants that you can go to to provide advice to you, right? So very much see your medical team as people providing you a service. Don't see them as people uh, like a like a pseudo parent telling you what to do. They absolutely should be advisors to you um, for your disease and how you manage it. Uh, not you should not be a passenger on this. You should absolutely be driving how this works. Um, in terms of what I would change with healthcare in Australia, there's a being exposed to things like international conferences through programs like the DDoc program. I see a lot of technology out in the world uh, which is in Europe and in the US uh, but is either not available here yet or may be available but has to be purchased at full price and that's very frustrating uh, especially when the same conferences will show the significant benefits that some of the new technologies uh, provide in terms of uh, management of diabetes, um, in terms of long-term outcomes, average blood sugar levels, things like this. Uh, so yeah, bringing those medications, bringing that those um, those technologies that help manage diabetes is something that I'd, I'd love to see more of um, in Australia. Another aspect which is often overlooked here and and in many countries, truth be told, um, is that of mental health. I think mental health um, is greatly underrepresented as part of the healthcare teams for people with diabetes. Um, there is a mental strain. Uh, with managing it just because you're thinking about it um, an awful lot during the day because you've got to manage that blood sugar level uh, and there's a lot of information out there that makes you question whether you're doing the right thing whether you're eating the right foods whether you're managing it right are you sleeping enough are you taking the right vitamins so it's, it's very easy to get stressed and um, get mentally exhausted so having um, good reliable affordable mental health care I think is essential and it's something that uh, should be available for all chronic diseases. And I think that that should uh, be more available in Australia. Uh, thank you, Tino, for the opportunity to provide this response on the questions you've asked. And uh, have a good day. Hello, I'm Jill Eastman. And I was asked, how has type 1 diabetes impacted my life? Well, I was diagnosed at 18 months of age, which means 59 years I've lived with this condition. It has impacted every area of my life. One of the greatest gifts I have received with this condition is being able to participate in a research trial. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I remember being at school, and you know, grade school as a young child, trying to get to different classes and losing consciousness. I was failing math and a straight A student in every other subject. It wasn't until I started middle school or junior high as we called it then that we figured out I had PE then math right before lunch. So in junior high we implemented a snack after PE and before math class, but at that point it was too late. I struggled with math my entire life and that's just one of the many outcomes in ways that diabetes has affected me. What has been my secret in managing my diabetes? 
that I'd recommend to my younger self? Well, I wish I would have gotten into a research trial at a much younger age. Of course, research trials when I was younger were not as far advanced as they are now. I had the opportunity. I was one of 12 of out of 128,000 applicants for a research trial being done at the University of Miami Diabetes Research Institute. And in 2005, I had two islet cell transplants, not full pancreas, just the cells that produced insulin. And I lived free of external insulin for 11 and a half years with better blood sugars than most of the doctors following me in the research study. And they would, they would tease me about it, about how good my numbers were. They used to tell me if my blood sugar levels were my heart rate, I'd be dead, which was amazing. Having grown up all my life, never feeling good, to feel good and to not be constantly, oh my God, where's the blood sugar? Oh my God, do I have something to eat? Oh my God, I have to do this, I have to do that. Oh, wait a minute, where's the glucose monitor? I gotta check the blood sugar. It was so nice to be free, to know what non-diabetic feel like because remember I was so young when I was diagnosed I never knew anything else I would speaking to my younger self I would say participate in research trials sooner because you just don't know what's going to happen and I would say try harder because I have to say I was very angry and very resentful that I had this disease, that the moms at the birthday parties would be whispering and then I would get handed something different than the other kids. Today, there's carb counting. Today, there are more tools to work with managing the diabetes. I didn't have that then and I saw that and it was just one more reinforcement that I was different, that I wasn't like everyone else. And believe me, I ate so much stuff I should not have. My mom would ask me, Jill, where did the cookies go? Oh, I don't know. I knew they were down my throat and in my stomach. So um, I would have worked harder. I would tell myself to work harder at taking care of myself. Honestly, I'm very lucky. I'm 60 years old. I have virtually no side effects of the diabetes. And a big part of that has been because of the research that I was selected to participate in. The retinopathy that I had starting in my eyes, my ophthalmologist told me, he said, I'm writing in your chart something I've never written before in a diabetic patient. And that is the retinopathy is gone. About the status quo of health in the USA, what do I wish I could change? Well, I don't know about health in the USA because to me, health is a very individual decision and choice. You can choose to exercise or not. You can choose to eat foods that are good for you or not. If you don't know what those are, you can get on a computer, you can search for that information. It's readily available today. Where I see the bigger problem is with corporate greed in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm going to use a word that some people might be a little uncomfortable with, but it appears that there might be collusion between senators and congressmen and women and the pharmaceutical industry. How can a bottle of insulin range in price from $350 to $500? And if a patient comes in and they need a refill on that insulin vial, 
and their doctor's on vacation and doesn't refill the prescription, they can't get that vial of insulin. To me, that should be something that if a diabetic patient walks into a pharmacy and they can show that pharmacist a medic alert bracelet, a insulin pump, something to confirm that they are a diabetic, it should be a given that they can get that insulin and ideally at a more affordable price. But there's greed. There's corporate greed and a high incentive for profit. Why? Because they can. Why? Because they don't care. If you don't have it, you will die. That's why some patients here and in other parts of the world ration their insulin. And if you guess wrong in the rationing, we get to light another blue candle, which means another one has passed away. Those are the ones that make me angry. Those are the ones that are senseless. But there's, oh, you gotta have this piece of paper. Oh, you gotta check this box. You gotta check that box. You can't make it simple to get a life-sustaining medication. That's the change. I would implement if I could. So I am currently doing one of my favorite things and that is traveling, but I take time out to answer this question. One thing that um, healthcare providers can do to help reduce the amount of misdiagnosis, I think it's two things. One, listen to people when they're telling you that something is not right with their body. And the second thing is test for T1D antibodies if something is not right. And also remember that you want to make sure you're treating the person for the right condition. And the person wants to be treated for the right condition as well. Hello, I am Felissa DeRose, and you can find me on Instagram at Black Diabetic Info or Twitter at not underscore defeated. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank Tino, my type 1 buddy, for asking me to share my perspective as a caregiver for type 1 diabetes during World Diabetes Awareness Month. So thank you for that. Um, I hope um, some of this is helpful. Um, Tino asked me to specifically answer three questions. Uh, the first is the impact of type 1 diabetes on my family. The second is caregiver tips. And the third was the state of the U.S. healthcare um, and insulin market and what, I could ch what it could change about it if I could. Um, and so the impact on my um, family is easy. My son was diagnosed um, in grade school. He's now a teenager. So, um, you know, he, the burdens have been financial, um, surely. Um, there's a mental stress that goes with type 1, and there's also, it's also very time-consuming. Um, and so just to elaborate the mental stress, um, you know, he was diagnosed in grade school, so every um, school activity, every um, sports activity, every band concert, every band practice, you know, you're in this 24-7 of always trying to plan, um, and type one doesn't take a holiday. It doesn't sleep. So, you know, overnight, you know, you're losing sleep, trying to plan, trying to manage the highs and the lows, um, and, you know, trying to keep your kids safe and happy and healthy. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, you know, stress that goes with that. Um, and so you're sort of always in this plan. Um, and then there's the financial um, impact on my family. We, we have really good insurance and we live in a you know, in a state with great healthcare infrastructure, but despite that, um, healthcare, you know, health insurance itself is expensive to buy. Um, and then insulin, I mean, nobody can afford 1000% increases. So insulin is super expensive, even if you have insurance. In technology, um, like the pumps, the insulin pumps and the CGMs are expensive. Again, even if you have insurance, and, and then I worry because my son is going to eventually age out of our insurance and he'll be faced with, you know, having to cover all of this for himself and he might not 
have good insurance or he might live in a state that doesn't you know have good insurance so it's sort of like this sort of unknown that adds to your anxiety um so that's a financial burden and the other um burden is how much time it takes i i mentioned earlier you're always planning you know whether it's a play date or an after school activity you're just always in planning mode but the other thing you're also always on the phone you know fighting with insurance companies fighting with pharmacists fighting with doctors rescheduling appointments so your son can go to their concerts and things like that um and so that you know that's definitely that's time consuming all of that um and so i also think about you know how that's going to impact him when he's an adult and you know i always try to think of you know ways that i can alleviate that um but i don't know if i can but anyway until he's 26 um we can at least um know that he's on our insurance so that is a little bit of peace of mind um and this the second thing that tino asked me to go over were caregiver tips i don't i know there are many um good ones out there here are five that i came up with um gee, one is to just educate yourself um read everything you can um from books to blogs um to to articles i you know i read everything just because it's such a steep learning curve and for me i find the more i know like the, that kind of eases my my stress to kind of know more know about like what i'm dealing with um and there are really good books out there from um how to how to think like a pancreas to this insulin pink panther book um but also the the blogs um you know their firsthand experience usually the blogs that um that i've read and that firsthand hand experience is invaluable um you know um just it's worth its weight in gold to um to read somebody's you know firsthand experience about how they got through something or you know what advice they would have about you know certain things about insulin pumps um because that's something you really can't get in a doctor's office so to me that was huge um embracing technology um you know we do have the pump we do have the cgm so f we're lucky um i know a lot of people can't afford because they're super expensive, even if you have insurance. Um, but also a lot of kids don't wanna wear the pump or the CGM because it doesn't fit in with their fashion or their sport. That's really, really common is kids not wanting to wear it. So if you can embrace it, embrace it. Um, but if you can't, you know, you just have to kind of let, like maybe in the future, keep trying that again. Um, the third thing um, is peer support. Um, people with, who give people who have type one and people who care give for type one, there are much higher rates of everything from depression, burnout, anxiety, eat, um, eating disorders. And so you really have to um, reach out to your peers to educate yourself. They say people with um, chronic diseases do better when they have peer support. So whether it's through social media or in person groups, I just would. Um, recommend that you embrace it any way you're comfortable with um because the the information that i've gotten from these groups um whether it's in person or online it's worth its weight in gold because you know it can be at 12 a.m um so midnight it can be at 4 a.m that you're you know contacting somebody and lots of, sometimes they contact you back and that makes you feel you know like you're not out there alone which is always a good thing and usually, you know, it's that first-hand advice, um, which I find is usually really valuable. Um, it's not always just a word of caution, like 85% of everything I get is really, really good, but there's always that percent that you really have to kind of sift out, but you kind of learn, you know, what to tune into and what not to. So my um, third tip would be, you know, embracing peer support, whether it's in person or via social media, because you will um, learn so much. Um, and then the other thing um, that I always tell my son is type one is a team sport um, and we're on his team for life, his doctors, his family, um, you know, we're all on his team for life and I never want him to feel like he has to go it alone. I, I know a lot of kids do feel like that. And so um, I try to kind of be repetitive with that um, thought. Um, and then the last thing, um, self-care again, with being um, at increased risk of all of these health problems and mental health problems you really want to self-care whether that's um yoga and meditation i try that um sleep i'm not winning at sleep yet, yet but someday i will um but yeah sleep is very hard if you have type one or if you care give for type one 
Um, so if you can, you know, try to sleep, if you can try to do self-care, but it, it takes time. Um, self-care can be time consuming. Um, and a lot of people don't have the time, but if you can do something, just try to focus on that. Um, whether it's a walk, um, exercise, like I said, it's good for, you know, for me. Um, and then the fifth thing um, for my caregiver tips is to be flexible. Um, the numbers that you see more often than not are not going to be the numbers that you want to see. Um, you know, only um, the average A1C for a, um, a teenager is 10. And only 20% of anybody meets their A1C. And so, and so you're going to see a lot of numbers that, like I said, you don't want to see. Um, and, and you have to really choose um, how much conflict you want to bring into that relationship. Um, and, and, and that can be hard because, you know, you're thinking, you know, about complications and, and, you know, all of this stuff that comes with the higher numbers. But your teenager is thinking something different because their brain isn't developed. And what it and, and they're growing and they have, you know, in puberty and all this other stuff that you really, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle. And what the studies show is that when kids reach about 25, um, that's early adulthood, their brain is fully developed and their numbers get much better. Um, and so it's just sort of like this thing that you have to get through. Um, um, and so I would just say be flexible because you really, you know, don't want your child to self blame for something that's really not their fault. Um, and then the third thing Tino asked me to go over was um, the state of the healthcare market in the US and what I could change if I could change one thing. Um, and so basically um, I would change just making it easier to access healthcare in general um, into making insulin more affordable. Um, there's so many like hoops that we have to jump through, um, loopholes um, between you know, pharmacies and pharmacy benefit managers and all of the, you know, all of this sort of convoluted process makes our market very hard to access, makes it expensive and makes it um, confusing. And it's also the most expensive in the world and we have the worst outcome. So, I mean, nobody can afford 1000% insulin um, increases. Um, and so, so that, I mean, has to change. Um, and the other thing that I'd want to change in terms of, um, you know, making things more affordable, um, a lot of people with type one put off milestones like college or buying a house or getting married because they can't afford it. And I, I think that everybody with type one should be able to have what other people have. Um, and I don't think that they should think that they can't go to college or get married or buy a house because they can't afford insulin. And, and that is a very common story. Um, I think, I mean, people die here for lack of insulin, but the thing that I think happens a lot more than that is people just put off their future. They marginalize their lives and we need to change that for everybody, not just here in the US, but everybody. Um, and so that would be my, um, my US perspective. And I wanna thank Tino again um, for this opportunity. Thanks again.